Looks good. Okay, great. So I just want to say sorry for the chaotic start to the morning. Um, and it is very nice to be here and to present with all of you. Um, I do very much apologize. This is not the way I thought this morning was going to go. Um, just to do a quick introduction, my name is Christina Trajan. I am one of the first year allergy and immunology fellows. Um, prior to starting this fellowship, I was actually an assistant professor at Seattle Children's in Pediatric Infectious Diseases, where I worked with my mentor, Dr. Tom Hahn, researching TB host pathogen interaction. And I'm excited to share some of my work today on immunogenetic mechanisms, regulating BCG vaccine responses and susceptibility to pediatric TB. Um, so because I know this is mainly a room filled with allergists and immunologists, I thought I would just start with a brief recap of the BCG vaccine. Um, so the BCG vaccine is made from a live attenuated strain of Mycobacterium bovis, and it is the only vaccine that is currently available and approved by the WHO to reduce the incidence of TB in humans. It was developed starting in 1908 and has now been used for over 100 years with over 4 billion total doses given. Currently, we give it to, we, currently we give about 115 million doses per year to about 80% of the world's children, and we typically give it at birth. Um, so BCG, sorry about that, is highly effective when given to neonates in terms of preventing disseminated and pulmonary TB in the first five years of life. It is also capable of inducing the genetic changes in the innate immune system that can provide cross protection against unrelated pathogens. And this actually reduces all cause mortality within the first year of life. That being said, it's not a perfect vaccine. Um, really most importantly, it's efficacy of protection against pulmonary TB in the adolescent and the adult population is only about 50%. And this varies very widely across studies between 20 and 80%. So many factors have been investigated to try to explain this variation, including manufacturing, strain variation, prior exposure to environmental mycobacteria and the timing and route of administration. Um, unfortunately though, the immunologic mechanisms that underlie BCG protection against tuberculosis and why BCG gives such variable protection is still largely unknown. And this is quite problematic because our incomplete understanding of these immunologic mechanisms really hampers TB vaccine discovery and development. Um, in the 100 years since BCG was developed, we still have not been able to create a more effective vaccine and TB is still the single biggest infectious killer. Uh, worldwide. It has now resumed the top spot after COVID. Um, so we do know that there is marked heterogeneity in the host response to BCG vaccination. So this is a figure from uh, Helen Fletcher's paper where South African infants who received BCG at birth basically clustered into two groups in terms of their BCG responses at a transcriptomic level. So the first group had a lymphoid activation profile with enrichment for T cells, JAKSAT signaling, and TNF and IL-12 secretion. The second group showed a myeloid activation pattern with enrichment for myeloid cells, inflammation, and then changes in cellular metabolism related to oxidative phosphorylation and glucose metabolism. Um, we have seen similar dichotomous results in adolescents receiving primary BCG vaccine, with one group having a sort of a broadly pro-inflammatory response with um, CD4 polyfunctional T cells, and then the other group showing minimal inflammation, poor CD4 T cell induction, and then a predominance of regulatory CD8 T cells. Well, you, it's otherwise the same, like the same ethnicity, the same mm -hmm. Um, so largely, yes, um, there's a lot of nuances with studying the South African population. Um, it's a lot of like mixed heterogeneity, um, but typically for these studies, people, um, we do uh, correction based on ancestry to try to even out some of those changes. So the South African population is like a mixture of African, you know, European, um, Indian at times. So there's definitely a lot of that mixture in that population. We do not use this vaccine in the U.S. It, the only country in the world? We are not. Um, most of Europe now lo no longer vaccinates. The decision whether or not to use the BCG vaccine is really based on the prevalence of TB in the country. 
Um, this was more of an issue before the IGRA, but the PPD is cross-reacted with the BCG vaccine. So the issue is that if you were to vaccinate people against BCG, you would not be able to then test them for tuberculosis infection very easily. Um, so with that in mind, it was always this balance between is it worth vaccinating everybody? Is the benefit for that so high versus is it still more important that we retain our ability to test? Um, and that is a, kind of a constantly evolving picture as countries continuously reevaluate whether or not they want to BCG vaccinate their population. Um, at this point, you know, US, most of Europe, uh, Western Europe does not. Um, okay, so um, as I was saying, there's market heterogeneity in the BCG uh, host response and host genetic variation is a possible mechanism by which the BCG immune responses and TB susceptibility vary in different individuals. So there have been multiple studies over the past 50 years that have demonstrated a substantial degree of heritability for susceptibility to TB that is shared across ancestries. Um, as you can see on this slide, we have identified some genetic loci of interest, including those involved in um, interferon gamma and TNF signaling, but the major causal genes remain almost entirely unknown, um, a problem which is known as missing heritability. And this missing heritability is really best exemplified by the lack of consistent major findings from different large GWAS studies, genome-wide association studies. So really the question is, you know, why are we missing major genes and what new angles can we bring to try to understand BCG and TB immunogenetics? So missing heritability is likely multifactorial and includes several reasons that are all listed on this slide, um, but I really want to focus on the top two. So first, we have really historically only studied one clinical phenotype with a nearly exclusive focus on adult pulmonary TB. And expanding studies to include different clinical outcomes um, can address this gap in knowledge. Uh, for example, pediatric TB often occurs after primary exposure to MTB, where there may be no pre-existing adaptive immune responses, or in the case of infants that are BCG vaccinated, there would be more of an immature or developing adaptive immune response. Um, and these immunologic features really suggest that susceptibility may be more likely to be regulated by the innate immune response and have different susceptibility genes compared to adult TB. Um, second, studies have not historically correlated associated genetic variants to function. Um, and this can be done by examining intermediate traits through what is known as a cellular GWAS, which I tried to sort of uh, make a diagram for over there. Um, so associating genetic variation with clinical outcome, the way that we do in a classic case control GWAS study, is actually quite complicated it, for um, infectious diseases because of the small number of infected individuals compared to controls. There's added complexities due to variability in infectious dose and strain and treatment. The setting of TB nutrition plays a role. Um, so all of these programs could, problems can actually be largely bypassed by studying in vitro cellular phenotypes in immune cells. So for example, looking at associating genetic variants with like BCG induced T cell responses as an example. Um, so advantages to this approach include the ability to provide clues to, as to mechanism, um, as well as a lot of guidance for experimental follow-up. We do know the cell of interest, which is always very important in uh, GWAS studies. And uh, the other really helpful feature is that it works on smaller sample sizes, for example, what we see with pediatric cohort, cohorts. Um, there have been prior studies uh, looking at cellular GWAS in the setting of um, tuberculosis and immune function, we do know that there are genetic variants that regulate immune subset frequency and expression of surface markers. Um, and we have identified specifically within the setting of TB variants related to interferon gamma and TNF responses as being genetically regulated. Uh, that being said, as you know, sort of what we see with the case control, there's still this issue of missing genetic variants and really an incomplete understanding of the underlying mechanisms that regulate BCG vaccine-induced immune responses and susceptibility. That's a very naive question. Why do we rely on this? So now we try to make a vaccine against uh, the actual pathogen. Uh, we have tried. None of them work better than BCG. There, so we, we, there is work on doing like subunit vaccines, live attenuated TB vaccines, 
um, sort of trying to find the specific parts of BCG that are more immunogenic and isolating those. Like, like there was a big study um, recently, and essentially the best we've gotten is a vaccine that is equal to BCG, despite a hundred years of research. It's it's really interesting that we seem to have largely stalled on on improving BCG vaccine. Um, and a lot of work now is actually evolving into trying to focus more on different populations. So BCG, as I said, works really well on infants, not so much on adults and adolescents who have already had exposure to environmental bacteria, mycobacteria. Um, so there's sort of whole new approaches that are now trying to be developed to try to boost pre-existing adaptive immunity. Testing, yeah. Testing for quantifier and goal, but there's still the same resistance to getting BCG. Since we don't have to test that. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, largely there's not much need, for example, in the United States where um, CD is very well controlled. And typically we are able to identify people who are at risk. You know, we have like to find risk factors. And I think that being said, it, I think it's probably a discussion that needs to be had more. Like I grew up in San Diego, um, where there's a much higher prevalence of CD, and Alaska there's a much higher prevalence of CD, and sort of why we have this universal guidance um, towards not giving the BCG vaccine. I think is you know maybe something that needs to be really thought and sort of do it based on local epidemiology. Um, okay, so genetic regulation of the BCG immune response can occur at multiple different steps. Um, so BCG is first recognized and internalized by local resident innate immune cells, and then later by infiltrating dendritic cells and macrophages. Um, in response to BCG, these cells upregulate co-stimulatory molecules such as CD40, which promote T cell activation. Um, they upregulate PDL PDL1, which inhibits T cell activation. So you sort of have a titration of inflammation through that through that mechanism. Um, and in addition, we get the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF, IL1 beta, and IL6. Um, these activated cells, which are now bearing BCG antigens or carrying live BCG within them, then migrate to lymph nodes. Where they, provo where they promote a mycobacterial specific Th1 adaptive immune response. And this leads to the secretion of high levels of cytokines like interferon gamma. Um, and it's really this adaptive immune response that we think is ultimately able to clear the BCG infection and the, um, in most pa patients, and then the site of inoculation will scab over after two to four weeks. So to test the genetic regulation of several steps in the innate immune response to BCG, we used a cellular GWAS approach and we examined whether both innate and adaptive BCG induced immune responses are genetically regulated. Though for the purposes of this talk, I'm only going to be talk, I'm only going to be speaking about the innate immune responses. Um, the work on the adaptive immune responses were actually spearheaded by a grad student in um, the Han lab and um sort of, you know, kept separate from this. Um, we then complemented the cellular GWAS that we did with a case control GWAS to assess if human genetic variation is associated with susceptibility to pediatric TB. Um, so in order to answer these questions, we worked with a South African cohort of infants. So SOTV stands for South African TB Vaccine Initiative. Um, basically, this is a huge study at a field site um, in Worcester, South Africa, that has one of the highest incidences of pediatric TB disease with about 3% of children under three developing active disease. Um, enrolled infants received BCG within seven days of birth, as is the standard of care in South Africa. And then um, I think about 11, over 11,000 were enrolled total, uh, of which half took part in an additional study evaluating BCG-induced immune responses, their genetic associations, and association with protection against um, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we collected whole blood from these infants at 10 weeks of age, and then infants were followed prospectively for two years to identify which one would go on to become TB cases versus controls. Um, in total, we genotyped 543 controls and 139 cases using an Illumina Mega X B chip, which uh, provides results for about 2 million different single nucle nucleotide polymorphisms or genetic variants um, that are all thought to be sort of haplotype defining. 
Um, so um, we then assess the BCG specific innate immune responses for 192 control patients, of which 166 had corresponding genotype data that you know passed all of our QC um, and was included in the final analysis. So this is basically the um, flow panel. We took whole blood that was collected at 10 weeks of life. We stimulated it with BCG or media, along with some co-stimulatory molecules. Cells were harvested and fixed and cryopreserved and then stained for uh, cell markers like CD3, CD14, CD16, uh, CD66, et cetera. We uh, looked for cytokines like interferon gamma, TNF, IL-6, as well as cell surface proteins involved in antigen presentation and T-cell activation like HLA-DR, CD40, and PDL one um, the gating strategy is shown on the slide. I'm not going to go over it in too much detail. And then here are the plots. Yep, sure. I think we can largely just assume that the gating strategy is appropriate. Um, <laughs> and I think what's probably, uh, for some reason, this, the cursor isn't really showing up on the screen, but um, basically what you can see here, blue is BCG, red is unsimulated, and you can see that when we do simulate, you can see a shift in the amount of expression of CD40 or PDL1, and this is monocytes and neutrophils that are shown here. Um, and this is sort of like the summary down here in the corner of the, of the gating strategy that we did. Um, so um, basically, when you look at the flow panel, there are over 4,000 theoretical combinations of cell types, surface markers, cytokines, etc. cetera. Uh, we went through most versions of most combinations of which only nine had a sufficient induction and range of BCG-induced responses to genetically analyze. So this really suggests to us that there's only a small subset of leukocytes um, and responses that are mediators of genetically regulated BCG-induced immune responses in whole blood. Um, so those nine outcomes are shown here. Notably, we are interested in CD40, IL-6, and PD-L1 expression in myeloid dendritic cells, plasmacytoid dendritic cells, uh, monocytes, and neutrophils. Remaining traits included TNF, interferon gamma, HLA-DR expression, and that had minimal induction across all cell types. And basically, we did not include them in further analysis. Um, so, you know, on the right, you can see the difference in BCG simulation versus unsimulated across all patients that we looked at. And then um, on the right-hand side here is the background subtracted um, BCG-induced vaccine responses for IL-6, PDL one and CD40. So you can see the spread. Uh, so neutrophils are one of the first responses to tuber tuberculosis when it enters the lung or BCG when it goes into your arm. Um, it typically is associated with poor outcomes, much more of an inflammatory response, much more tissue destruction in the setting of in the setting of mycobacterial infection. And this actually tends to lead to a greater ability of the mycobacteria to escape the cell um, and spread. So that's you know well, we make this strong neutral response that's a poor mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. Um okay. So um this is basically our experimental design. We assess each of the nine BCG-induced innate cell phenotypes for an association with genetic variation. We imputed the genetic data set using the TopMed server. That resulted in taking our 2 million variants, going up to over 7.7 million variants. Um, and we basically fit a generalized linear mixed model where we associated the flow outcome with the genotype, and we adjusted for sex, for ancestry, and for kinship. Um, and then basically, um, for this, we used an additive model. So, you know, there's different models you can use to test for genetic association. You can use the traits are recessive, dominant, or additive, in which case every copy of a minor allele is expected to be correlated with the phenotype. So that's the model that we used here, um, and is standard in typical uh, GWAS studies. 
Um, and then after that, we go on to analyze and check our top results. Um, so these are the Manhattan plots of the results of the cellular GWAS. Um, the, basically, I don't know how familiar people are, but basically the chromosomes are on the x-axis. The negative log of the p-value is on the y-axis. So the higher up you are, the more significant your variant is. Every dot is a variant. Um, and basically, um, you know, as you move up, you can see stronger associations. And we sort of hope to see like peaks, like what we call skyscrapers, because, you know, variants are in linkage with each other. Um, so the hope is that you'll have a top variant as well as some associated variants that might have a weaker signal. Um, so basically what is very exciting about these plots, and I know that they're small, but basically there are multiple variants that reach genome-wide significance. So that's a predefined threshold of p-value less than five times 10 to the negative eighth. And that's defined based on the number of independently um, at least the number of haplotype blocks that can be independently um, inherited. Um, so basically what this is evidence of is that the innate immune response to BCG is genetically regulated. And this is the first time that this has been demonstrated. Um, so in total, there were 56 variants that met genome-wide significance. Um, they are in li linkage disequilibrium with each other, so they are inherited together. Um, and when you do subsequent analyses, you can identify that there are actually only 17 independent lead variants, um, which um, map to 18 genes. Um, so in order to... Yes. Sorry, sorry, just on that, I may have missed it. Were, were the cell types sorted and then to analyze, or like everything together and then analyze the cluster based on like the cell uh, We tried to cluster first, then yeah. Um, so in order, they've identified certain variants that indicate you can make poor innate immune response. Mm -hmm. Worse than one. That is the whole purpose of this project. <laughs> so the goal is to identify immunologic mechanisms that underlie BCG induced immunity so that we can target those specifically in new iterations of the vaccine, whether that's through adjuvants, whether that's through, you know, finding the portions of BCG that activate those pathways and, you know, modifying them to be more immunogenic. We can't change the host. We can't, as of right now, we can't change the host. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is back to the gating strategy here. Um, but basically, we tried to gate first by cell type and then gate on expression. Yeah. Um, OK. So we have 17 lead variants. We then want to validate them. So this is basically the plots of the various variants against their um, cellular phenotype outcome. Um, so for, I'm only showing 11. And the reason for that is that for six of the variants, an individual with two minor alleles had an outsized effect on the model. Um, and we basically did like follow-up analyses using dominant models rather than additive models. And if it was non-confirmatory, we dropped them out. So basically these are the 11 variants that pass the confirmatory analysis. Eight of them are associated with PDL1 expression in dendritic cells, su suggesting that this is a cellular phenotype that may be the most genetically regulated. Um, additionally, there's one genetic variant that is associated with PDL1 expression in monocytes. One is associated with IL-6 expression in monocytes, and the last is associated with CD40 expression in dendritic cells. Uh, yes. PDL1 and then CD40 will activate it, IL6 will activate it. Um, so at this point, I've hopefully convinced you that there is evidence of genetic regulation of BCG induced innate immune responses. Um, but what is helpful in addition to identifying specific variants of interest is also identifying genes that are involved in this immunogenetic mod modulation. So there's a specific approach for that called MAGMA, which stands for Multi-Marker Analysis of Geno Genomic Annotation. It basically uses a multiple regression model that incorporates variant data as well as linkage disequilibrium information to try to quantify the association that each gene has with the phenotype and essentially allows us to analyze multiple genetic markers simultaneously. Hopefully that 
made sense to people. Um, it generates Manhattan plots just like a standard GWAS, um, but the difference is that this time every dot is representative of a gene. Um, so in doing this, we were able to identify two genes that met a genome-wide significant threshold, IgLL1 and um, ZNF600. Right there. <laughs> um, so uh, IgL1 is associated with CD40 expression in myeloid dendritic cells, and uh, ZNF600 is associated with IL6 expression in monocytes. So delving deeper, shown here on the left are the geno genomic loci for IgLL1 and ZNF600. Um, and then basically, so this is like kind of the genome, you've got the p-value on the top, and then on the bottom half is the CAD score, which is a predictor of the deleteriousness of the variant. Um, dark blue is exonic variants, which typically have higher CAD scores. Um, so basically, if you look at IgLL1, you can see that the um, association is largely driven by two different variants. Uh, there's on chromosome 22, there is a lead variant RS2096522, um, which is shown up there. And then a secondary associated uh, lead independent variant. Um, and you sort of see the same um, pattern here for ZNF600 with a lead variant that's in purple and then a second um, independent significant variant. Um, in the case of ZNF600, um, the one of the variants is in the exonic region, and as you can see, has a pretty compelling CAD score. Um, so the function of ZNF600 is not that well defined. This is actually the first evidence that it may play a role in regulating the innate immune response and IL-6 expression. Um, as for um, IgLL1, there's a lot more that we know about it. It was the only, so just to kind of give some background, this is the only gene that was identified both in the magma analysis as well as the traditional GWAS that I did. It's a pre-B cell surface receptor that's involved in the transaction of signals related to proliferation, differentiation from pro-B to pre-B. Um, and basically, um, you know, it is the mechanism by which it may affect the BCG vaccine response is not known. Um, it may affect the ability of B cells to secrete BCG specific antibodies, impairing the ability of the monocyte to recognize and bind to target cells. Um, there's also emerging evidence that within the macrophage, IgLL1 is actually a target for host pathogen interaction. Um, there are certain intracellular bacteria that actually secrete proteins that directly um, interact with IgLL1 and alter cellular signaling, although that has never been defined for tuberculosis itself. Since you mentioned that it's working B cells, you haven't said anything about humoral responses. What's, what's going on with in itself? Yeah. Is, is, is that an effective way of um, inhibiting tuberculosis? I would say that the jury is still out. It has largely been understudied and sort of thought to not play an important role. There are now new studies, and most of which have just come out in the last like three or four years, that suggest that um, there are TB-specific antibodies that are created that may play a role in um, basically clearing the infection. Um, we're starting to define different like repertoires and things like that for BC for B cell antibody responses. So a whole as I sort of said, like there's a whole second analysis that was done looking at the adaptive immune response that I that we've not completed here. Um and honestly, I know I some of the results of the T cell analysis, I don't know if we have looked at these cell phenotypes, which I think is a great point. Um, and if so, what those results would be. And the T cell is really of the adaptive immune response, probably the cell that is most designed to play a critical role in clearing TB. Based on what we know today. Um, so basically, in summary, at this point, we've identified 11 genetic variants that are associated with the innate immune response to BCG vaccine at a genome-wide significant level, and we have also identified two additional genes 
um, and their respective variants that associate with innate cell responses to BCG, again, at a genome-wide level of significance. So, you know, we next wanted to look at, you know, plausible mechanisms of action for these variants. So we examined whether uh, the lead variants mapped to specific genes using both positional mapping and EQTL mapping, which I'll go over in a moment, as well as predicted functional features, which are sort of summarized with this CAD score for gene. Um, so basically, if you look at the mapped genes, you can see that, you know, IGLL1 is there. Um, in addition, we, we mapped genes that are involved with TNF signaling here and WNT signaling here. Um, and then as for the other genes, they are involved in phospholipotransport, GTPase activation, um, tyrosine dephosphorylation, ubiquination, and glycan biosynthesis and vesicle trafficking and autophagy. Um, these are all pathways that have already um, been identified to play a role in TB host, path host pathogen interaction, although, you know, we do not have a great understanding of all of the nuances of um, these interactions. Um, but this, you know, is reassuring to us that we are finding variants that all basically make sense. Um, we then also examined whether the lead variants match to specific genes using what's called cis EQTL. Oh, here, actually, you know what? Let me just take a step back. Um, so, um, with regards to the positional mapping, probably the two most compelling uh, associations were with TNF signaling and WNT signaling. Uh, this is based on having a higher CAD score. Um, typically over 12.37 is considered deleterious. This one is over the threshold and that one is just right up against it. Um, so in looking at these two genomic loci in more detail, we identify two genetic variants on chromosome, sorry, we, we identified a genetic variant on chromosome 22 that maps to WNT7b, and then a genetic variant um, on chromosome 6 that maps to uh, TNF receptor superfamily 21, which is also known as death receptor 6. I think that's how most people would probably know that. Um, so, you know, in terms of mechanism, yeah. Each dot is a variant. A variant. a variant. Yeah. So um, basically, this is like the chromosome. This is the gene, like where, where you know, on the chromosome, the gene maps. These are all the different variants, variants that were um, part of the analysis that we did. And then their p value is on the y axis. Um, and you, you can see oftentimes they are inherited together. They're colored by essentially what's called like a correlation coefficient. So the degree of linkage disequilibrium. So red is more likely to be inherited with like the purple variant, for example. The yellow one is less likely. And then by the time you're in the gray, you're, you're independent. That makes sense. Um, so basically, WINT and beta catenin signaling is known to play a role not only in TB pathogenesis, but also in responses to BCG. Um, and has been previously associated with susceptibility to TB disease. There are many ways in which um, MTB and BCG interact with the WNT signaling pathway. I just showed one here. This is basically TB being recognized by the NOD2 pattern recognition receptor um, and inducing WNT signaling, inflammasome activation, and apoptosis. We also know that activation of WNT signaling reduces BCG-induced macrophage necrosis. Um, and basically when pathway activation following BCG infection results in decreased interferon gamma induced autophagy activation. Um, you know, we think that modulation of this pathway may improve our ability to elicit an effect, um, an effective anti-tuberculosis uh, vaccine response. That's our hope. Um, sort of similarly, we identified a variant in, as I said, the death, um, death receptor six signaling. Um, which is a TNF receptor. So basically in this situation, following TNF stimulation, the encoding, the encoded protein uh, interacts with TRAD um, through the death domain. And then this results in activation of NF kappa B and MAP K8, uh, which ultimately results in um, the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines as well as apoptosis. Um, so the role of TNF signaling is um, well-defined in the setting of mycobacterial infection and BCG vaccination, where TNF secretion 
in response to infection, typically augments the T cell response and also promotes macrophage um, phagolysosome fusion. Um, so basically here, what we are doing is we're providing evidence that the BCG induced TNF secretion is genetically regulated. Um, and then the last thing that we did to try to um, associate these genetic variants with, with function is what's known as EQTL mapping. Um, so basically EQTL stands for expression quantitative trait loci. And what that means is that it's a variant that affects expression of its associated gene. Um, and these are cell type specific. So we performed EQTL mapping using expression in various immune cell types. Um, you do this by referencing certain databases. So in our case, we use what's known as the DICE database and the EQTL consortium databases. Um, the former contains cell types, most of which are adaptive. And then the latter um, also includes some innate immune cell types, which is what we were looking at, obviously, for this flow panel. Um, so in total, we identified five EQTLs and immune cells that were identified across six genes that met or were in linkage dis disequilibrium with a variant that met uh, genome-wide significance. Um, three of those variants that are shown here have the same variant pattern as we saw in the SOPI population. So it wasn't only the location, it was also the alleles that matched. Um, and you can see that that includes the genes MTX3, COPS3, and FLCN, um, as well as TNNT3. Um, so <clears throat> none of these genes are associated with variants that are, you know, any of our top 11 hits. However, COPS3 actually was one of the initial variants that met genome-wide significance that we filtered out because it had one patient with two minor alleles that had a disproportionate effect on the model. However, this would be compelling evidence that perhaps we should not have filtered it out because there is a plausible mechanism of action by which COPS3 may alter uh, BCG-induced immune responses. Um, basically, um, you can see that in classically activated monocytes, the presence of the mon minor allele is associated with reduced expression of COPS3, um, as well as uh, in FLCN with a sort of a less clear association um, for FLCN in the uh, adaptive T cell, adaptive T cells. Um, so together, these analyses suggest that several variants reaching suggestive levels of genome-wide significance do map to genes with plausible mechanisms of action regulating BCG immune responses. Um, so this is a kind of a quick summary of everything that I have gone over and hopefully persuaded you of, that the BCG innate immune responses are associated with 11 lead variants um, at a genome-wide level of significance, that gene-based analysis identified two additional genes and their respective variants that are associated with innate cell responses to BCG. Several of these genetic variants reaching genome-wide significance map to genes with plausible mechanisms of action regulating BCG immune responses, are cis eqtls and or have predicted deleterious function, and that we have identified po possible, that's misspelled, sorry about that, me uh, immunogenetic mechanisms underlying the heterogeneity and host response to BCG that provide hypotheses for therapeutic intervention. Um, so what is the current time? 7.7. Okay, so so I will just pause here. Um, we did also, as I said, briefly do a case control GWAS looking at susceptibility to pediatric TB. Um, we did find about 104 suggestive variants um, that mapped to 38 lead SNPs um, across 65 genes, although none met a genome-wide level of significance. That being said, this is the largest pediatric TB case control GWAS that has ever been done. However, there are still like less than a thousand patients in it, which would be very small for GWAS. So we had also defined a second suggestive threshold of a p-value of less than one times e to the negative six, and that's where these values come okay. from. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so for our purposes, we wanted to see if any of the, it was sort of a two-step approach. We first wanted to see if any of the genetic variants that we had identified in the cellular GWAS were associated with um, case control outcomes. And then because we at that point had assembled the largest 
cohort for pediatric TB um, with associated genetic information, we then went on to perform a case control GWAS using both the, you know, pre like, you know, the, the genome-wide standard threshold as well as we knew we had too few patients. So then we used also the significant threshold of... I remember the design of this study, the kids are born, and they all get ECT. I don't think we wanted to get the growth of this. Most of them don't. That's the original design. And, and your study is basically figuring out those who got ECT but went on to get TB. What small TBs they had. We found 11 plus two more. Mm -hmm. And now for the second study, the little genes go up in the mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. I, and, uh, you know, it, I was trying to just, it, I mean, that was fabulous. I was going to say, I mean, normally I would have marched through it a little slow. I just wanted to basically say that we did do this analysis. We did find some evidence of genetic regulation of susceptibility to pediatric TB specifically, um, but not at the genome wide significance level. Um, because, there, however, I'm not going to go through this in a bunch of detail, probably our most impressive finding was um, this is a variant in PDE8A, uh, which we think may affect host susceptibility to TB disease. As you can see, presence of the variant, um, so two would be the presence of two minor alleles, is associated with a increased susceptibility to TB disease. In addition, the variant is also an EQTL, which gives us a plausible mechanism of action. PDE8A, yeah. Um, a plausible mechan mechanism of action by which it may affect the susceptibility to, to TB disease. We do not know which cell type it is acting in, um, but we do know that it plays a role in hydrolyzing uh, cyclic AMP and essentially um, thus has an immunosuppressive effect. Um, we did try to take it back to the flow panel. Um, you know, based on pre-existing literature, we suspected that um, the presence of the variant would result in increased PDE8A levels, which would result in decreased uh, cyclic AMP levels, um, and that this would be associated with decreased PDL1 expression, uh, specifically in like monocytes and macrophages. Um, and as you can see, when we did look in the flow data set, we did find an association between the presence of the variant and uh, monocyte BCG induced expression of PDL1. Um, and then reassuringly, we did not find the same association for IL6 or CD40. So this to us suggests the possible mechanism by which genetic variation can, you know, affect both uh, BCG induced innate immune responses as well as um, susceptibility to TB disease. So with that whirlwind tour of the case control GWAS, I, there are 10 minutes left. So I thought I would open it up for any questions that people have. So they have tried that. They've... So um, is there any benefit to multiple vaccines? So there have been multiple studies done looking at revaccination with BCG in the adolescent population, um, as well as you know vaccination with new novel vaccines in the adolescent population following BCG vaccination. Um, we do see a transient benefit, but it's very short lasting and thus, you know, from a global health perspective is not thought to meaningfully curtail the spread of tuberculosis. Um, that strategy, however, is where most efforts are currently being focused in terms of the development of new vaccines, um, because, you know, ultimately the cycle of TB is, is really, you know, children die of tuberculosis, but they're not the ones that spread tuberculosis. So to really break the cycle and to get a hold of, you know, what is essentially a perpetual pandemic, um, the focus has shifted towards trying to target adult TB. Like these kids that so, you know, we we don't have the ability to sort of personalize medicine and, you know, identify which children do and do not have specific variants. Um, you know, the most of the work that has been done is sort of related to Mendelian susceptibility of microbacterial disease, where there's, you know, some patients with inborn errors of immunity who we know get disseminated TB 
um, but we don't really know what makes somebody a good responder versus a poor responder. We also, I mean, you know, talking about the problems with BCG vaccine is, is the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, we don't have correlates of protection really for BCG vaccine, which makes studying it very difficult. You really have to do these studies where you go on to see who develops PD disease, which are incredibly resource intensive. You know, like for example, with COVID, where we have a spike of BCG antibody, we can measure that as a surrogate. If I remember correctly, one of the greatest successes of this testicle disease was more or less eradicating tuberculosis in a country like ours through hygiene. Mm -hmm. You do with antibiotics, you have to keep it through the genetics, you have to get into the BCG through hygiene, right? Mm -hmm. right? The turn of the earlier century. 1600, yeah. Um, that's not a question, that's just sort of a statement, but. Why does that not work worldwide? As opposed to this approach, I mean, I respect what you're doing here, but this is tedious yeah. work. It really is a like, problem of hygiene in the third world. I think it is. Also, I think we have to be sure that we look at diseases with an appropriate cultural mindset, right? These are families that live in huge group homes and, you know, PD spreads easily through those homes. It's also at the point, which is a little bit different, where it's also in the community. So they acquired, you know, in the United States, you really have to have a household contact with PD in order to get PD, but in the global setting, you can get PD going to the market um, because it's that prevalent. So, you know, I think with that in mind, we do have to be cognizant that there may need to be different strategies in order to, you know, eradicate TB. And, um, you know, it's unrealistic to think that in the next 100 years, we're going to fundamentally change our family structure in a way that results in more isolation of people to prevent the spread. There's also a much younger, you know, there's many more children around, so the death rates are much higher. Um, so I think it would really require, you know, I think if, we're, if our hope is to get a hold of this within the next 20 years, which is sort of the goal of the WHO and Stop TV initiative and all these things, I think it really is going to take technological innovation to get there. It had to be institutionalized in order to get tuberculosis in the world, but it had to be in Those places don't exist anymore, but we don't have many cases of TV here. How do we handle it in Queen County? Um, so we generally ask people to, I mean, if you're hospitalized, you're hospitalized, you're not sick, right? But sorry, we generally just ask people to self isolate. Um, you know, typically, if you can, the issue is usually identifying the cases. Typically, once you've identified a case, um, you ask people to isolate for about two weeks. Um, if they're on anti-tuberculosis therapy, typically within about two weeks, their sputums will become negative, at which point they can move out and about in the community. There are obviously a small number of patients who don't like that, um, who are not compliant, and then there's, you know, public health gets involved. But, you know, for the vast majority, it's a relatively short isolation period um, before they're not that deep in cases anymore. The, the issue, however, is that we think that most cases, most cases of transmission come before we identify an index case. Um, so trying to get a hold of that is really where most of the public health efforts currently are using contact tracing and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The parents of these children also express knowledge whether or not the parents are going to be able to do that. Is that something that's like that? So it's not something that we're looking at. I think what really complicates this with the setting in TB specifically is that the, you have to understand, like TB and humans have co evolved for 70,000 years. Um, it is a pathogen that is so finely 70,000 years. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. The nuances of uh, they've just they've gone. I I don't know. There's one study that I read that this, but they basically like they they went back to try to identify like when approximately when they think that TB branched off from the parent genome, 
this is sort of like the realm of the microbiologist, which is not me. I'm much more like a like a translational immunologist. Um, but the clear microbiologists have methods by which they can basically backdate when different strains branch off, and that so their their get their guesstimate is that about seventy thousand years ago is when it branched off, and we have I think data like a finding to be I think back about thirty five thousand years in human remains. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about whether or not we want to look in, in families. So so that's what makes, I think, looking in parents incredibly difficult. On top of that, we are all exposed to environmental mycobacteria, all of which is going to alter our, our host response to TB when we see it. So I think that it, it is worth looking at. I think we would all love to have trio geno genomes. Genomes, I think, is this, obviously cost is a big issue when you're talking about research on pathogens that are mainly prevalent in the global setting. Um, but I think that interpretation is going to be particularly complicated by all of these other factors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, oh, um, do we think that some of the genetic variants that we have found are specific to TB or more reflective of sort of general susceptibility to infection? Um, and I think that the answer is both. I think that a lot of the pathways that are identified with this type of analysis are pathways that are known to play a big role in intracellular bacteria. So I think it also would matter for things like um, salmonella, typhoid. Um, you know, there's this feeling that a lot of the responses that we see in response to TB invasion like into the macrophage are actually oftentimes the cell is sort of upregulating these viral like responses that are protective against viruses that actually tend to be hurtful in the setting of TB. So I think that there is this like co-evolution between all these different intracellular pathogens and how the cell can try to tease out exactly what is the pathogen and exactly what is the proper response to that pathogen versus this other pathogen. I yeah. So we've done that. So ESX1 tends to be the biggest gene that's in tuberculosis that is associated with increased pathogenicity of, of mycobacteria. Um, there have been vaccines specifically trying to target it that have not been more effective than VCG. Um, which I think tends to be a recurring theme. Um, and then I think what makes TB particularly nuanced is that we also have evidence that because it has co-evolved with us for so long, it's actually not just the bacteria, like the fact that it's TB, it's actually the strain of tuberculosis. And there, there are specific host pathogen interactions that are between the specific ancestry and the specific strain that lead to altered pathogenicity. So if you were to move, so like, um, an example, like a theoretical example, would be if you took the strain that's predominant in Africa and you moved it to Asia, you may see that it is all of a sudden much more severe in the Asian population compared to the African population because they have co-evolved with TB and they have a more balanced post-pathogen interaction compared to a, a different strain. Does that make sense? Yeah. We've been trying to do that in the malaria and like. Um, Seems the infectious patterns that they can spread. Yeah. Try and change MPD and introduce the elements of the non infectious microbacteria. Yeah, like how would you, yeah, how would you do that? I think it's, it's hard because the only reservoir for TB is the human. So whatever you do, you would have to do in humans to alter it. So I think ultimately that would be a limiting factor compared to malaria, where you can just treat all the mosquitoes. Nobody cares about the mosquitoes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 
Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking about introducing some sort of genetic modification that you would give to a human that would be targeted to the bacteria that's in the human. It, it, would, it would be very complicated to pull something off, but I think it's an approach we're thinking about. One point six million per year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at this point, uh, Christine. Christine. Yeah. Hi, this is Frank. This is Frank up in the. Oh, cloud hi, yeah. Uh, uh, has anyone looked at TNF alpha as a vaccine ad adjuvant for BCG? Yeah, people have looked at TNF alpha, IL six, IL one beta, um, sort of just also just a slew of adjuvants that sort of broadly simulate the innate immune response. Um, the data is mixed. Some will show some increased efficacy, um, but not substantial. And the vast majority show increased uh, side effect profile. Um, if you want, I can pull up some like specific papers and send them to you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I suppose the catch-22 is not knowing like individual people that have these SNPs that would they probably would help a lot more. Exactly. Um, uh, I think that if we could, as with all things, if we could get down to personalized medicine, which is really what, yeah. you know, immunogenetics offers us the potential of, we would be able to be much yeah. more targeted and be able to optimize uh, our yeah. interventions much more accurately. Right. Yeah, so the, the world of like what we call like XDR TB um, is very fraught. Um, that being said, in the last three, three years ago, four years ago, um, the WHO, for like the first time in, I think, 30 years, approved a new regimen that is all oral, um, targeted for multidrug resistant TB. Uh, so we basically took our treatment courses from being two years with IV administration of drugs, which you can imagine people were not compliant with that, down to about six months with an all oral regimen of three drugs, uh, linazolid, uh, bedaquiline, and uh, Potomac, there's BPAL, Potomac, and then plus or minus Rivofloxacin. So that has that has been a very substantial piece of progress, um, sort of in the fight against the Not yet. I think I think um, the fact that these treatment courses are shorter, and that people actually have the ability to complete them and be compliant, I think helps us in the fight against the development of further resistance. Um, on top of that, you know, the drugs are honestly better. They're they're they act intracellularly, they're more targeted to mechanisms that make TB susceptible rather than us just using, you know, historically we've just used like outside of, you know, isonizid and, and rifampin, we were typically just using standard antibiotics against TB, things like, you know, aminoglycosides, carbapenems. Um, that were never really particularly designed to be TV specific. Thank you very much. Thank you. I got the general point. Details I don't know. That's all right. If I can just convince you, the BCG vaccine responses are immunogenetically regulated. I am happy. <laughs>